Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ on this proper 7, Luke 8, 26 to 39, Demon Possession Among the Gerasenes. In my last podcast, I talked about how you can develop these sermon series within the lectionary. And this one is a really interesting one. This is the, the first of, a, I think, a series of three texts. Um, I'll be doing the next text with you, which is Luke 9, 51 to 62. And then after that is the sending of the 70. And this is, of course, Jesus' rejection in Samaria. And the text is this one here for the three pericopes. Now, it's sometimes hard to see how they fit together, especially since this is in the Galilean ministry. And now this is, the, of course, the moment where Jesus turns his face to go to Jerusalem. So we're here in Samaria. And this is, of course, in Samaria too. But in many ways, what we have in these three texts is we have the presence of Satan. This is obviously the main theme here in the text for today. But this three texts end with Jesus saying in Luke 10, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And he's saying that in response to the ministry of the 70 who in their preaching and in their healing, Satan is defeated. So Satan is actually cast down from heaven by the preaching of the 70. And that's, a, as you know, a St. Michael and All Angels text. That's in Luke 10, 17 to 20. But anyway, I, I think that that would be a, a great kind of way of perceiving that. And I'll talk a little bit um, in the next podcast about how this fits into it. And I think it does, you know, the casting fire on the earth. I think there's a real sense here that we, we are dealing with the, uh, the, the, the apocalyptic battle between Jesus and Satan. Now, this is a, a text that causes a lot of people a little angst, especially those who are kind of animal rights people because of the, the swine being you know, cast uh, into the sea and dying. But again, and, and I talked about this in my last podcast, one of the really big issues here is, is the idea of, of the purity code, who is clean and unclean, And one of the things that I think really comes through in this text is that when you enter into the, the world of the demons, this demoniac here, you know, the demon here, um, <clears throat> his name is Legion, so there's many of them. You, you are entering into, into that, that world that is unholy. And Jesus, the Holy One of God, the one who now is the purity code. All holiness is, is, you know, centered in him. That which is clean is measured in connection with him. When he is there, you know, I mean, he, he undoes, he destroys those who are unclean and unholy. Now here is from the commentary, the uh, kind of an outline of it, setting, problem, exorcism. And then you have you have two responses, the response of the herdsmen and the town people, and then the response of the demoniac. So you have a double response, and it takes a, you know, a not insignificant part of the text. We saw a response in the, the widow's son at Nain, you know, which I think is an important uh, kind of parallel here, that, that when Jesus performs a miracle, there's a response, and people... Um, are affected and changed by the, the relationship to that miracle. Clearly, the center of the text, you know, is, is the exorcism, you know. And, and here's the great miracle, so to speak. Now, for some people, as I said, who are very sensitive to the fact that the, the swine are the ones that are, are the, the kind of the, 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 the place where the demons are going to find themselves. But remember, 
in this day and age, in this world, in this culture, swine were unclean. And so they were, you know, letting the, the demons come into the swine. Uh, that, that's a natural thing for them to, to, to do. And, and, and drowning them, in a sense, is, is Jesus defeating Satan and defeating those things that are unclean. So anyway, there's, there's a, just a, a, a very simple sort of outline of this text. Now let, let's go to the text, and it's a long text, and it's hard to show it all on the board here. So let's, let's just, you know, look at it in pieces, um, and I'll just kind of scroll through it, and I'll be a little bit more pedantic here, you know, in, in terms of going it uh, verse by verse. Um, the setting are, are these two, first two verses here. And we're in the Gerasenes, which is on the east side of, of um, the Sea of Galilee. And that's close to where you would enter into the Decapolis, which is our Gentile towns. And so we're outside of Israel. And that tends to be the, the very nature of this place, is being outside of Israel, people who are from Israel, the Jews, would think of it as unclean, you know. And um, here's this, this man, so it's a, it's a human being who has demons. He's demon-possessed. I put that in purple because that's kind of a repentance color. Um, and I, I love the, the, the notion of, of the, the tombs here. This is a place of death, and this is a place where there are dead bodies, and it's not necessarily a place where there, people are clean. Um, when we start in verse 28, we, we have what I call the problem. Here's the problem. And um, this, this demoniac is, is afraid, cries out in a large, a lo, lo, uh, large, yeah, a large voice, a, a loud voice, we would say. And I love this expression here. You see this of the demoniac in Luke 4, 31 and following. What to me and to you? You know, what is this to me and what is this to you? And here is a great confession. That this is one of the themes of Luke, that the demons know who Jesus is. They know who he is. Human beings, you know, until the confession of Peter and really not until the resurrection and Pentecost, they really don't know who he is. And, and he knows who, you, who he is. Jesus, look at this, Son of God, the highest. Now, that's not just simply Son of God. It's the highest one, the heavenly one. You know, this has echoes from, from the, the, um, the Annunciation, where Mary is catechized by the angel, the very, you know, Son of the Most High, I think is the, the expression there. And he, he's begging him to sort of... You know, leave, leave him alone. He, he's afraid. He knows that when, and, and here this is the demoniac, when clean and unclean meet, bad things happen to people who are unclean. Now, there is the language of unclean, an unclean spirit. So that is a further definition of what a demon is. And, um, you know, the, the sense of, of being in prison and being in the desert, these are all themes of demon possession. And if you remember what I said in the podcast at the widow's son at Nain, these are all part of this language of being in bondage to the, the virus of sin that if infects the world and infects people in a way that is even um, more powerful than any other way of describing it. I mean, he, he, he senses that this is an act of torture. I mean, that, that's really what that word means. And, uh, you know, being in chains, it, it's, a, it's a horrific situation to be in. Now, this is the only place where Jesus has a conversation with a demon. I mean, literally, 
a conversation with the demon. And, and this is the second part of the problem. Um, because of the way the board works, we have to put it here. But it, this is what he, what he calls himself. It, my name is Legion, you know? He has a name. The demon has a name, because there are many of them. You know, and it is interesting, this, this conversation between Jesus and the demon, where they, they actually go back and forth. And, and, you know, what do the demons, the legion demons do? They beg Jesus. Parakaleo. They exhort him. You know, this is often a positive thing in terms of, you know, kind of exhorting people to a, a sanctified life. But here they're exhorting him that he not throw them into the abyss. And the abyss, of course, is sort of the, the place where there is complete darkness. It's, it's b the, giving them over to the fullness of who they are as demons. And, and they, they're afraid that they're going to be destroyed. That is what the demon says when he says, What to you, what to us, Jesus of Nazareth? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. You know, you have come to destroy us. The demons are afraid of being destroyed obliterated by the one who is clean. And here it's indicated by being cast into the abyss. Now, they, they got it right. They got it right. They, they see very clearly that this is what Jesus is about. He is here to, to in a sense, destroy them. And here you see, by their, their fear of going into the abyss, you see the, the Christus Victor theme, that Jesus has the power to defeat Satan, that he is going to, to defeat Satan, you know, and, and I love, as I said, that line, you know, from St. Michael and all angels, you know, um, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. The exorcism is here in 32 and 33, and, and this is, in a sense, the heart of the text. And it, it, it's, it's where, did I get that right, 32, 33? Yeah. Um, th this is where you have that, that moment where he permits the demons to enter into the swine. You know, there's the word for exhort again. You see it? Um, and <clears throat> the demons, the, the demons, are, they come out of the man. You know? And they enter into the swine, right there. And, and, and what you see here is that, that this is where Jesus provides this man who is possessed with legions of demons, the great release. And they are destroyed. They, they go into the, into the, to the lake and they are drowned. And it's a, it's, a, it's a, really, I mean, in a culture that lives under the oppression of all kinds of bondage, and, and demon possession was a significant one, affected body and soul, this is a huge moment. It's, it's certainly not the equivalent of a resurrection, but it's close. It's close. And it is the power of Jesus over the darkness. And he, he is bringing light, he is bringing life, and most importantly, the release shows that the Holy One of God has power over those who are unholy, unclean. So this is the great moment where you can really see how Jesus does have the, 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 the power to, to defeat even those who are opposed to him in the sort of the supernatural apocalyptic world. Then we have these responses, first by the herdsmen and the townspeople in 34 to 37. Let's make a break here so you can see it. Okay. And then the response of the demoniac. Now, <clears throat> this is an important word here. This is a word for announce. It's a word that comes from the family of proclamation, preach the gospel, excuse me, proclamation. So they're, they're beginning to announce the, the great release, the herdsmen are. 
And what, what is so interesting here is having heard this announcement, the people come to see Jesus. There they are. They come to see Jesus. They are the ones now who are, you know, to see. They come to him to see him, what has happened. And, and, and they, they see the evidence. They see the, the one who is possessed by demons clothed there at the feet of Jesus. And look at their response. They are afraid. Now this is exactly how the people were after the resurrection. I mean, I think this shows you, even though it's before the confession of Peter, that you could almost say, a great prophet has risen among us. God has visited his people. This is an acknowledgement that they are in the presence of holiness. This is, this, is, this is somebody who comes from God like a prophet, who has the power over demons. And, and there, again, is the language of proclamation. It's repeated in verse 36 there, you know. Um, but notice what happens. They, they reject him. You know, they, they, they ask him to depart from them. And, and Jesus begins to depart. He gets into the boat, goes up into the boat. You know, great fear had seized them. There's fear again. So fear is used twice here. You know, they just don't know how to understand this. They don't know what's happening here. They're almost like the demons that are afraid because they are unclean to be in the presence of holiness. I can't, I can't emphasize enough how important the purity code is for this world. And finally, you have the response of the demoniac. And, you know, I mean, he obviously has been caught up in this. He wants to be a disciple of Jesus. Um, uh, he, I, I love this word here. It's, it's the word that is used in one uh, one to four in the prologue for the gospel. It's actually in verse one. It's a, a diegesis. Diegesis. It's a narration. Sorry, I shouldn't have a... Oops. It's a, it's a narr narration. They are, in a sense, narrating the gospel. That they're, they're telling the gospel story. And then, this is really most significant. It, it's, it's even stronger word than... Apangelion, they are, I mean, preaching throughout the whole city as many things as Jesus did. This is, of course, the demoniac. Um, Jesus does tell him to be a disciple, even an evangelist. That's what this word means. It's an evangelist to narrate the, the story of Jesus, to be that evangelist in his own home area. And he does. He is preaching. So, so you have a, a kind of mixed reaction here. That they're afraid, but he is, you know, an evangelist. And, and I think it's very important to recognize that, that what we have here in, in this text is the, the, the mystery of the presence of the Holy One in an unholy world and how he's demonstrating his, his power to release people from bondage but that it causes as much anxiety and fear as it does comfort and, and wholeness and healing. Now, I, I think it's sometimes hard for us in our world to understand the demons in the world of Jesus. Um, it, it was different than our world, although I will say in a postmodern world, with the, the rise of the acknowledgement that there is the supernatural. Demons are going to be more evident. People are going to talk about it as if they actually do exist. Back in my day, we didn't believe in demons. I don't mean me personally, but my, the world I grew up in, in the mid, middle of the 20th century, it was very, very, you know, kind of, you were kind of strange if you believed in demons. They're certainly a part of that world today. But most people now do understand that there is this supernatural reality. And it, it's insidious and it's coming in upon us. And we have to recognize that it is only through the power of Jesus' word, the word that, that we speak, that we proclaim, like this demoniac. And it's, it's a word of, 
of, of comfort and certainty that when we hear that word of Jesus, demons are cast out. The power that Jesus has over demons, over sin, over death, is the power that now is in the word and the sacraments in the church where we, when we speak like the 70, we see Satan fall like lightning from heaven.